Okay, so good morning and welcome everyone. Um, today we are going to set aside for a moment uh, the work on React uh, uh, in order to uh, start seeing what uh, we should do on the server side uh, of the web application. Um, what we did uh, on React was, was fine but was not enough because, for example, everything we did uh, with our data was lost, immediately lost uh, and tragically lost uh, when we reload the application. So as, so, uh, as soon as we hit uh, the refresh button, uh, all the data structures are, of course, deleted and are not uh, persisted in any way in the browser. Okay? So um, basically, we, we need uh, to have some location, some mechanism, uh, in order uh, to persist, persist the, the, the data, the information that the, <coughs> that the React is handling. And this can only be on a, a separate location, uh, on a central, centralized location, uh, and that uh, uh, requires, uh, for example, mm, and this is the easiest solution, a web server uh, that we can use uh, to uh, retrieve data, retrieve the latest version of the data or the information that we need, and to modify and store and add new information on a database uh, on a server, living on a server. Hmm? So uh, the idea is to learn the technology that we need uh, to do that uh, in a minimal way. Uh, you remember that uh, there are two courses after this one, if you are interested in this uh, uh, pipeline, um, uh, digital system uh, program, me, I don't remember, sorry, and the web applications too, that will focus more on the integration between client and server, um, the distributed system programming, and uh, uh, on the mm, back end on the server side itself, uh, the web application two course. Okay, so here we are trying just to uh, spend the minimum uh, amount of time and give the minimum amount of knowledge. Uh, to get us ready uh, to support the backend of our React application. So it's not uh, um, a full uh, say solution for uh, server-side development, and we are not going to see, um, let's say, more uh, recent mechanisms that imply, for example, server-side rendering of the pages uh, where the, re the render operation is split uh, between the server and the client, which is something that nowadays is gaining traction because it's, uh, in a way, it may, it it allows uh, the, the browser to be lighter and maybe the application to be faster. Mm -hmm. So we are not going to talk about any of this. Uh, for us, the server will be a mechanism for storing and for persisting, for remembering the state values, uh, um, the values of the state uh, variables uh, across different, uh, uh, say, uh, um, executions of the application. Mm -hmm. Okay, uh, Express, uh, it is the uh, one of the packages that runs into Node.js uh, that allows us to uh, implement a very simple web server. Hmm? Uh, well, a very not a simple web server, it's a implement a web server in a simple way. Hmm? Uh, it's not the only one, there are many packages for that. Uh, it's not even the most efficient one, uh, but since we are already uh, working in the JavaScript ecosystem, uh, it made sense uh, to choose a JavaScript uh, framework for, for our uh, little server, okay? Uh, if you want something more powerful, more efficient, maybe you, you, you could uh, look at other options with uh, more compiled code and not uh, um, JavaScript. But anyway, it's, uh, we already work in Node, so uh, it's easy to, to extend our knowledge uh, uh, to support Express. And also, having a server written in JavaScript may allow us to you know, share some data structures between, or some desi design decisions also between the server and the client. Mm -hmm. um, what do we need it for? Uh, basically, for support, as we say, supporting persistence of our application in a database uh, through a set of uh, API, through a set of uh, function calls that uh, the client may, can make on the server uh, that will require or request the server to modify, or to read or modify data in the database. Hmm? Um, okay, uh, I, I, I don't want to recall for the 15th time probably the um, HTTP protocol, I will just only focus uh, on uh, two or three main concepts that we need later 
uh, when uh, we um, when we write the code basically mm -hmm. so remember we are uh, now discussing about uh, the communication between the browser and the server we are inside our react application and the user just maybe inserted some information in a form clicked on submit and we want to save this information on a database somewhere and this somewhere is inside a web server okay so we should in a way call a mac um a function a method uh and an endpoint on the server to say okay please store this data for me this may only happen through http http okay we already know it as a protocol uh, because it allows navigating websites but http by its nature or by its invention was mainly done for uh, delivering html content or images or other kind of, of other or other kind of content so we are going to in a way hijack the http protocol and use it for a different purpose not for delivering web content but for exchanging data and comments this would be the second part i'd say of the um, of the lecture after 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 we understand the basic mechanism of the http server we see how to use it uh, uh, for for this uh, persistent mechanism what we should remember is that the http protocol is based on two message schemes one request and one response is a strict request response protocol for every request there should be one response it's a text protocol uh, where all data is exchanged between the client and the server in, in text format. And so we have a format for the request message and the format for request uh, for the response message. And the format for these messages is, is the same. There always is one initial line, uh, then a set of headers, both in the request and in the response, and optionally a blank line and the so-called response body. Okay, so server and client exchange these kind of messages. The communication is always initiated by the browser, by the client, that will send a request to the server. The server will receive uh, this request on a TCP IP port where it's listening, and uh, will elaborate this request and finally generate a response. Um, and uh, the request first line is basically the command what we what the client is asking for the server to do so 99 or more percent of the uh, requests are of type get uh, get is the, the simplest HTTP request is the more common one which is the one that we use when we click when we click on a link when we uh, enter a, a web address and so on okay but it's no, not the only one so we need to learn a bit about uh, uh, all the other commands in uh, HTTP parallels that are called methods okay uh, so what operation we, we need we are asking and what is the URL the local part of the URL that uh, we are interested in hmm? uh, okay and then the protocol version the initial line so every request will always start with a line like that and the possible commands are listed here in HTTP 1.1 uh, get is made for reading a resource uh, post is uh, made for usually for form submission data so the browser when you fill a form and click on the submit button on the browser usually the browser will send this data with a post command um, that will send uh, the data actually of the form in the request body so that is not it does not it does not uh, uh, pollute or, or modify or or, or it's or is visible on the URL and these are the two get and post are basically the two uh, methods that browsers are normally using in react we are we will we are not uh, submitting forms so that uh, or when we have a submit button we always mm, activate the prevent default uh, function just not to avoid the browser to send this post command we will use this post in a, in a different way okay so as we said we are reusing the HTTP protocol with, with a different purpose from what it was intended. And then there are these other two comments, put and delete. Uh, we'll see how, how we can use them. The, the idea is that delete should delete a, a resource on the server. The browser normally does not use this. No. When you are browsing something, you are not 
deleting resources on the server. You're just getting you know, a new pages. Mm. So let's keep in mind uh, that there are several comments, and then we see how we can use them. Mm. Um, OK, the response, uh, the, the important information about the response first line is that it contains a status call. Uh, the famous uh, 404 if the page is not found, uh, or 200 is uh, the request is OK. This means uh, we are starting to fill the shoes of the server uh, that we should generate a status code for every request uh, that we receive. So we create a response, and the first thing we need to do is to decide which is the status code of our request. Normally, it would be a 200, but what we, we may choose uh, uh, among uh, um, different, uh, different type of options uh, in the different groups uh, of status codes. Uh, so the status code is the first information that will tell this, the browser whether the request went well or uh, created some problem or could not be executed for some reason. Uh, then we have a set of header lines that, uh, you know, there are uh, different, uh, okay, there are 46 uh, uh, official headers, but there are hundreds more because the browsers will add stuff uh, and the servers may add stuff uh, to these uh, um, headers. Uh, for example, in the example that I captured before, there's a, sort, uh, uh, a set of headers that the browser is sending for helping the server to customize the response. And these are the um, headers that the server is sending back uh, to describe the kind of response uh, that it got. Mm -hmm. There's only one mandatory header, which is the host. And since the host uh, name is not part of the get command, you, you must specify this in a different way, in a separate line. But usually, these uh, headers are generated by the browser itself. We will care about the browsers uh, in a couple of weeks uh, when we deal about uh, authentication, uh, because the headers will uh, will uh, transport the cookies uh, that will contain uh, authentication information. For the moment, uh, for today and this week and the next, uh, we don't need to, to modify or to customize them. And then we have the, the body of the request and or the response, depending on the command, uh, in some cases, the request is uh, optional, uh, the body is optional. In some cases, it's mandatory, depending on the type of command that you have. Uh, basically, it's a text uh, block uh, separated by a blank line. Mm -hmm. uh, of course, if it's a text block and we need to um, send structured data, right, uh, we must encode that in some way. Mm -hmm. So there are different types of encoding of the, of the body of an HTTP message. Both request and response is the same. Um, when we submit a form with the browser, uh, the browser is uh, uh, encoding with this strange format called uh, form data, multi-part form data. Uh, usual, uh, but it's something that the browser does uh, for let's say its native submission mechanism of the form. What we should, what we normally want to do is to uh, maybe exchange information in a data description format, and we can use the JSON format, for example, which is basically JavaScript uh, for encoding the object description. So we should uh, tell when we create a request message, if we have a body, we should say, okay, the body contains some information that is encoded in JSON, and what the server so that the server can decode it correctly. And vice versa, when the server sends better a response and the response body contains information about some JavaScript object, we will encode it in JSON and uh, set a, uh, a header, which is called a content type header, to, um, de um, to de describe the type of encoding that we are using. So uh, we should just remember uh, every time we are using a body, we should encode it and tell the encoding okay write the metadata in the headers that will allow this uh, to, to be to be understood mm -hmm. um, okay uh, in this table we have some uh, summary about the different methods uh, that will tell us for example there are some methods that may allow a body in the request for example get doesn't allow uh, the request to contain a body Post uh, must contain a body and also put and so on. And uh, uh, the same for the response body. The get usually has 
some re uh, body in, in response, and the post uh, uh, usually does not have any anything in the body of the response, but we may use it. It's allowed, hmm? so we may use it uh, to to maybe get get back uh, um, the latest version of the resource that we just uh, saved on the server. So. Uh, you see that uh, in HTML form, so the basic native mechanism of the browser, only get and post are used. All the others are for programming, okay, for us. Um, there is this column idempotent, which is a strange word, uh, that it says that describe whether what happens if the same um, command, the same uh, request is sent uh, more than once. So imagine I'm sending a get command for a page. And then I'm sending the same get command, identical, one second later. Uh, Idempotent means that uh, uh, the state of the server does not change if I call the same method more than once. The state of the browser may change because if I, if I retrieve some resource a second later, maybe some information may have changed. So it's always possible to do a get and it doesn't change, hmm, the should not change the state of the server. So this tell is telling us that we are, if we want to implement some operation that will change the state of the server, it should not be a get. Hmm? We should not use the get method because it will be against uh, uh, the, the, um, its definition, basically. It will work, uh, but not, al not always because it will clash with proxies, will clash with uh, um, caches that will assume that this is true. So they assume they can issue a get any time without any damage. Mm -hmm. uh, on the converse, if we are posting something, it's, we are assuming that it will change the data on the server. And so if I post a, a new exam, it will add this. And if I post again, uh, I will add a second time. Or I get an error because maybe there, there's some duplicate data. Okay? So it's not the same posting twice as posting only once. Uh, you 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 see that when you're navigating, sometimes you go back to the previous page, and then the browser says, "Beware! Uh, uh, this page was generated by a, co a post command. Do you really want to send the post a second time? Mm. Because it's, uh, it may not be the same. Okay. Um, if you want to modify something that uh, uh, in a idempotent way, so that the modification uh, can be uh, repeated." We can use the put method. Uh, the put usually is for modifying an object, so maybe setting it, uh, setting the date. Hmm? So I send a command put to set a new date to an existing object. And you know that if I repeat the same operation, setting a new date to the same object, uh, it will not change. So if I'm setting a date of tomorrow and I'm setting it once or twice or three times, <laughs> it will always be the same date. Okay. Uh, and so repeating a, a put operation should not, uh, more than once, of course, uh, should not change the, the end result on the server side. Put is your, a post on the converse is for adding new data. So adding once or adding twice uh, means uh, having one or two more data in the end. Hmm? So we're trying to understand how these uh, uh, methods were designed uh, to understand how we can use them according to the, the needs of our React application. Okay, so that's the basic uh, uh, features of the HTTP protocol and how we, how can we, uh, let's say, implement a server that will be able to execute these functions. As I mentioned, we are, we chose to use Express, which is one of the many uh, HTTP servers support, implemented or supported, implemented in JavaScript and supported in the Node ecosystem. Basically, it's the most popular one, so it was an easy choice. And um, it's very easy to, to install. We just need to install the Express package into our, um, into our project. Always remember to initialize the package.json and the node modules directory with the init command. And then you just run a JavaScript file, maybe index.js or server.js or whatever. And uh, mm, that's it. Of course, the, the JavaScript file will need to uh, use uh, the express function for publishing the, the website. Hmm. 
running a, um, a web server in this way okay it will start it but if when we are developing uh, the problem is that if you modify something in the in the, J, the js we need to stop the server and start it again so control c and start again and it may be boring okay we are uh, used to react where the when i whenever we modify something the it's, it's, it's uh, immediately updated on the on the on the browser okay to get a similar result uh, we could use a um, a tool mm, a, a utility called uh, nodemon uh, means node monitor and if we run a script with the node more command instead of node, it will uh, run node on the on the JavaScript file and monitor every change in that file and the other files that are imported, uh, the other modules that are imported. So whenever we modify something, a uh, node mode will automatically restart the server. Hmm? So it, in development mode, uh, it's very useful. You just uh, need to install, if you want to do that, you need, you need to install node mode at the system level. So not, uh, not in the package, because it's not part of the project, uh, it's part of your development environment. So my suggestion is to install that globally, minus G means uh, globally, so in the node modules of, the, of your installation of node, and not in the, in the node modules of your project. Okay? And depending on your installation, you may do, need to do that uh, in, a, um, in administrator mode. So in the, at that point, we just can just run with node mode instead of node and have this sort of uh, automatic redeployment of the application. Okay, so how we create, how do we create a, a web application? Actually, it's quite simple. We just need to create uh, one object, we call it app, that implements an express web server. So the express uh, function that is, um, remember we are back in a node, so we use require instead of import. Um, we just import the module, express, and call the function that we received uh, with the required, uh, um, say, import the module, imported module, and calling the express function will create a new server. We call it app, uh, an object to refer to our server. And to start, actually start the server, we can use the listen command, the listen method on this app object. Listen will start the web server, and this method listen is a blocking method. So actually, our execu the execution of our code will stop here, will not go uh, on, and uh, uh, until the web server is stopped for some reason, our execution will stop at this line. So our, the, the synchronous execution of the script will be stopped, and the server will start listening on the port that we specify for new HTTP requests. Okay. Um, so we can try to do that. So let's uh, open a new folder, a new project. Uh, we may call it uh, um, server zero. So the first server we create. Okay. A new project, a new directory. We initialize an npm init directory. Uh, entry point by default uh, will prompt you with index.js if you want to. Okay, so we suggest you that you name your server in the .js. If you want to call it in a different way, I don't know, server.js or whatever, you can change this URL here, and so that uh, uh, Nodemon will read this file to know what to run. It will just save you some keystrokes, but uh, and uh, that's it. Okay. Okay, so right now we have this uh, package.json installed, and inside package.json, or inside the project, uh, we need to install Express. And meantime, in the meantime, we can create uh, okay, a new index.js file that will contain our server. Okay, so it's, no, it's a normal JS file. Uh, remember, we are in node, it's not auto, the spring mode is not automatic. And we can enable it. And the first step would be to import the 
const uh, express require express and uh, as we said uh, listen on a given port okay so uh, well so sorry first we create an, uh, the application so application with the express function and then <coughs> we ask the application to listen on a given port usually we use the 3000 port or 2001 something like that uh, which is similar to the the one that we are using with react a second parameter <coughs> sorry of listen is a callback uh, that uh, is executed when the server is started so if everything goes well and the server may start uh, this callback is executed and we must just we could just write for example server started So this is a minimal website that does nothing. We can try to start it with npm index. Sorry, with node index. OK, server started is the message that we got here, saying that, OK, it's in some way in listen mode. If we try to point a web browser, to localhost 3000, the only thing we get is an error. The strange error cannot get slash for, for some reason. Uh, we can inspect also this reason in the inspector. at localhost 3000 you see the error here is 404 not found of course we are asking the web server for a web page that doesn't exist the web server is started by nobody nobody tells the web server which pages it should uh, uh, publish hmm? which resources it should uh, return and for uh, doing that uh, we should define some routes which are basically addresses that the server is responding to. So the simplest part is uh, defining the response to this request. The, we tried to uh, request uh, get on the home page, to issue a get request on the home page. The browser tried to do that. We want the server to be able to respond to this request. So in Express, we just need to add uh, what they call the route uh, by specifying the method. So we are, say, registering a callback on the application to respond to a GET request uh, on the slash address. And we need to say what happens when the, the, the server will receive actually that. So the, the server is, is in listen mode. It's listening to everything that is happening, is happening on this port, but with only React uh, when you receive a command like get or post or put uh, on the kind of URLs or the addresses that we are specifying here. Of course, there will be a mechanism for specifying more than one route and so on. But for the moment, we are just defining one endpoint, one address that this browser is able to respond to. And uh, responding to a request means executing a callback that will produce a response. The callback is uh, something like this. It's, uh, of course, a function in JavaScript that receives two parameters, a request object and a response object. Okay, so whenever the, some external client will call get on the slash address, my callback will be executed with these two objects as parameters. A request object that describes the request. Right now, there's not the 
uh, through the request object we may access for example to the headers the body to the query string every information that is coming in the request message will be available through that request object parameter that which which i receive as a parameter and then i have a response object that contains all the properties that will be translated into the response message uh, this response is already let's say initialized by express with some basic information we can customize the information and then finally we can generate we can ask express uh, to actually generate the response and send it back to the plan so at the end of this callback we should have replied to the uh, to the client with a response message and the easiest part is uh, sending a response back so the e the simplest method in the response is send the send method will compose a response body and send the request the response back and close the connection once i i send the response back i can forget about this request okay so when the callback is over so res, uh, response dot send for example this is the home page In this case, it's a string. Uh, normally, it would be probably an HTML string or a JSON data or whatever we want. This something is being put into the response body. So if I save this, uh, remember, I should stop and start again the server because I modified the code. Or just uh, use nodemon, nodemon, to start it once. Uh, and so we'll keep monitoring you see that if i'm modifying something here and i save the file the server is being restarted hmm, automatically so i i can forget about that hmm? and if we go to the browser and try to load again this page we have this very beautiful message home page but basically if we inspect what happened on on the network level at the network level okay we see that we have this get no this is the five, five, five item why can't i get uh, the actual network request ah yeah is there are they filtered uh, where Yeah, here, no. no. Ah, yes, thank you. Okay, thanks. I've never found in time. Okay, uh, so what we see here is that the browser issued a, a request for. Um, for this get slash get uh, is address and the server gen so generate a request which is basically empty that we we didn't have any request body and the response is made of some headers so we have the response headers here the response headers here and uh, the request header that, we, that the browser sent so we see there are a lot of them and the response body which is this uh, simple text okay now the browser is, th is thinking that the response would be in html uh, but actually it's just plain text we are just getting familiar with the mechanism okay it's not real we, we didn't uh, create a, a good response hmm? because the response header didn't specify a content type sorry didn't specify a content type of type text uh, to describe the kind of result but we'll, we'll get to that okay if we are asking for another address uh, abc we will get uh, a 404 error message that is generated by express saying okay okay i am alive i'm listening on this port but the request uh, you made it doesn't match any of my allowed routes hmm? so this is the basic mechanism um, we, we activate a server 
and we define a set of routes uh, and the actions to take uh, for every uh, route. The um, signature is very simple, application dot method, and method can be get, post, put, uh, delete, uh, and that's it. Um, the path on which we want to listen, so the route on which we want to listen, it may be one simple string or maybe something more complex like regular expressions or dynamic paths and so on. So there's a syntax here to specify which kind of uh, addresses we want to serve with this specific handler. And all the work, of course, will be inside this handler. Hmm? Um, this function, we mentioned that it received two parameters, this callback. And there are some uh, properties of this request object and response object. Hmm? Unfortunately, they are usually you know, abbreviated as rec and resp, which are very similar, <laughs> because uh, two out of three letters are identical. But just Try not to be confused. The first parameter is the request is coming in. We cannot modify it in any way. The response is, is our real output that should, we should generate. Hmm? Um, uh, basically, some properties of the request uh, uh, can be the uh, query string. If there is a question mark, uh, there is a, the, the request uh, may have a parameter request.query that contains uh, the query string after the question mark. Uh, body would contain the body of the request, uh, which is empty in the case of get, uh, but we may, be, we may contain information in the case of post. Uh, um, and the params uh, may contain uh, the fragment of the URL that, are, that we match in a dynamic way. We'll see that uh, in a moment. No? It's very similar to the React router mechanism, where we have se segments uh, of the URL that will match any string, uh, and that string will be available to our code. Um, OK, so this is the information you get in the request object. And we need to build a response object by calling some functions to modify its, uh, its content. So we, we are not modifying directly the response.body, because that would mean uh, <coughs> creating a string with the right format. Usually, there are methods uh, to call. Send is the, easy, the easiest one. Just uh, take a string as a parameter or a content as a parameter and send it back to the server, to the client. If the content that we are going to send is a, a JavaScript object, we can call the JSON method to encode it in a JSON format and send it. So instead of, of uh, taking an object, serializing to a string with uh, JSON.serialize, and taking this string and send it with the send method, we can just call JSON, which also has the side effect of setting the right header content type of application JSON. So this is a utility function that will set the content type, convert the object we pass in, a, um, in, in textual format, in, using the JSON format, and send the response. We may have a redirect method when we want the server to say, OK, from this address, please redirect the browser to another address. Or the AND method, or uh, yes, or the status also method that are used to, to change the status code. So normally, when we call send or JSON, the status code would be 200. OK. Redirect will be 304. If we want to send uh, another status code, we can uh, call this method on the, on the response. And if we want to send a, uh, the response without any body, or, so because uh, JSON will send a body, uh, send will send a body, if we want just to close the connection without sending any body in the response, we can call end. And we'll send the response without the body, hmm? if we need it. Um, remember always to, to send the response in some way. Hmm? Uh, for example, if I modify my server without clicking on, without doing this send, okay, I forget. What happens on the browser if I try to, you see that the browser is still waiting. The browser sent the, the, the request 
it has been accepted, it doesn't generate an error, it's not a 404, it's not a one connection. But the browser now is assuming that the server is doing very uh, heavy computation because it didn't reply yet. So every request should have a, res a response. And we should always close the record. Even if we are just uh, uh, maybe saving some data or uh, incrementing a counter or anything else, that where the, the browser doesn't need any information really for that action, well, we should in, in any case close the response no? because otherwise the browser will you see is still waiting. And what happens, uh, we will see it in React, uh, that when the browser times out, uh, will generate an exception. And this, if this request is made by your browser, in your code you will, be, you will get an exception when your application is doing something completely different. Hmm? Because uh, uh, maybe there is a, an open call that was not closed immediately, and later on you see, okay, there's a promise that was not fulfilled uh, and generate an exception, and you get that in a moment where you are doing or debugging something completely different. So always remember, every uh, address should always be gener generating a type of response. Send, JSON, redirect, or at least end. OK, I can say, OK, I don't have anything to tell you, but I just is sending a response. So in this case, if I reload it again, we see that the document is empty, size zero byte, the response is empty, but the, the, the request went through. Okay. Um, so this is the, let's say, the, the minimal command that we should know uh, for creating a response. Sending something, usually a text or HTML, ending a response. Uh, changing the status, uh, uh, we saw before there was the send status method that will change the status and close the connection. Or you can just can change the status without sending the response yet, and then use one of these uh, uh, sending methods. Hmm. So actually, this method can be changed every time you modify. You are adding something to the response, and finally you will send it. Okay. Um, the difference between send and JSON is that uh, in the first case uh, it will expect a string in the second case it will expect an object hmm? and okay this is the redirect um, so this is the very hmm, uh, low level uh, mechanism that can be in some way enriched if we want this uh, router to be processed in some way so Express allows uh, uh, to, let's say, define some plugins, uh, they call them middlewares, for helping you in the processing of the request. For example, you may want uh, some plugin to validate your data before executing your call, so checking whether some conditions are true, validating maybe the authentication, or doing something before calling your function or after calling your function. And uh, so you can specify one or more middlewares. Mm -hmm. you, these middlewares are um, registered on the application with some user method. When I call the use method, I'm registering a plugin, a middleware, on my application. And this middleware will be called automatically with the same request and response objects before calling my callback. So my the request that I, I get, or also the, the response that I get, are already pre-processed in some way by this plugin. And there are several plugins that do different uh, kinds of jobs. Okay, uh, They are all different because it depends. For example, one well, is very simple plugin is for logging. You see that the um, server doesn't print anything. If we want to log uh, some output to see what the server is doing, for example, there's one nice plugin which is called uh, Morgan. Okay, so for example, I install this plugin, npm install Morgan. 
be installed in my project and uh, I load it require Morgan and see that say that my application uses this plugin app that use And if it's working, not one, when I load a page, so it's not working, sorry. Uh, I don't remember. Okay. I, I should read the documentation. Hmm? Do you like it now? Yeah. So I'm creating a middleware. Of course, we should read the documentation uh, to, <laughs> to know how to customize it. And uh, the goal of this middleware is to log uh, every request or every request matching given uh, uh, so there's a default setting where the messages are logged on the console with this format so this is useful during debugging that we can see what kind of requests are received by our uh, server okay so we say that okay i received get and i, re I responded with 200. if i receive uh, the abc that we had before the logger says we received ABC and they responded with 404 and so on. With the um, parameters of this Morgan call, we can customize uh, uh, the kind of logging. We can decide which information we want to show, where to save it, and so on. Mm -hmm. So actually, uh, we are uh, inserting some pre-processing, which is done by this callback function, before my, uh, my real callback. If we want to create a new middleware, it would be very easy. A middleware is just a, a function with three parameters, the request, the response, and a next callback. Uh, I receive the request and the response. I can do whatever I want with them. Usually, we just don't close the connection, but we can modify some data. We can print something on the output and so on. And then I call next. Uh, next is a callback that will terminate uh, uh, the execution of this middleware. Saying, okay, okay, now you can go and process the response. Mm -hmm. And um, if there are, m there may be more than one middleware function uh, defined or installed in a, into our application, and they just are executed in sequence. If we don't call next, uh, then we are stopping the 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 processing of the request and you can generate a response be before even uh, is being seen by uh, by the actual route hmm? okay we are probably not uh, we don't need uh, right now to create a new middleware but uh, it's easy to download and install them <coughs> for the function that we need <coughs> sorry if we want uh, this middleware to be called only on some spe specific uh, portion of the website, uh, not all of them, we can use the second form of installing where we limit uh, uh, inside the path. Uh, so only the requests that are inside this path uh, will be, will call actually, actually the execution of this plugin. All the other uh, paths uh, will not be um, affected by that. So we can install site-wide or just uh, uh, for a given portion of the site or, ev or even for a single request, okay? Uh, if we want, uh, we can add before, as a second parameter, an array with a list of middlewares that will be called in sequence hmm? for some specific uh, use case. We'll, uh, we'll see more, de more details when we... Um, uh, when we need that. 
there's a one uh, uh, predefined uh, uh, middleware that may be useful is the so-called static middleware. Just imagine you have some HTML file on your server. Okay, so the, the home page is not something that we put into a string, but it's something that we put into some HTML file. So for example, we create a new file uh, index.html. And uh, we have uh, as a body, let's keep it minimal, the body will be just the home page. Huh? And we want that the slash uh, should not, uh, should return this file. So uh, for, for what we know, we should here, read this file from from disk and send it it's a extra work because we need to open the file read it into a string and then send it back and reading a file is, is an asynchronous operation so we should do the operation a callback okay it's very boring uh, fortunately for this very easy uh, behavior we can use this uh, uh, static middleware that will uh, automatically handle or serve to the, to the browser, to the, uh, to, the, yes, to the client, the content of some static files that we have in, a, in some directory. Okay, if we have some static files, uh, we can specify in which directory they are located so that the middleware will, will look into that directory to check whether there is some file with that name, and if so, it will be served hmm, instead. So, for example, uh, in this case, we want to maybe have a folder, let's call it public, with all the files, and we move this index.html inside public, so that we have all the static files into one directory. And we decide that the files into the directory can be statically served. So just uh, if the browser is requesting them, just give them, just give a, give a copy to them. So in this case, use a express dot static of the, let's see the parameter, just the directory that contains the files. Express with the teeth ah, in the right place. Okay. So what we're doing here is that at every request, uh, please check whether this request corresponds to a file in this directory. If so, just return this file. Otherwise, go on and try to process the request in the normal way. Uh, of course, right now is not working on the slash. Oh, yes, it is. Sorry, because index is a is a, um, a default name for for the home page. So right now, what we, the request made, we made here returned the um, the response the HTML page that we created without any effort. Of course, if we ask for anything else, uh, we'll still get an error. If we create, uh, if we want to serve, for example, another file, second.html, sorry, HTML, example, like this. And we just put the file there, and the web server will just serve the second. We ask for the second HTML file. Sorry, it will give it to me. Okay, so any request that will match the name of a file in the static directory will be served immediately. Every request that doesn't match this file will 
be processed normally. Mm -hmm. So in this way, we, we never get, in our case, we never to get to this, to our method, because it's already being captured by the static file, because there is an index file in the index is a special case. If we want to, in some way, there is some um, uh, overlapping, because if I have a, a URL like here, Uh, like uh, let's say ABC or whatever there's a confusion bet between okay there's a, a race because I, is there an ABC file in the study directory yes so it will be the response if there is nothing then this uh, route will be activated hmm? because we are using the same namespace if we want to separate the static resources into a separate namespace uh, we could use a second parameter well, actually, it's the first one as a string saying, where do we want uh, these files to appear in the URL? So we need to match a, a portion of the URL to deliver the, so you see that this lo.html is no longer published in the root position, but it's published under the static uh, URL. So just if you want to separate the, some files uh, and don't want to mix them with the URL of your API, uh, this is a normal mechanism. This uh, middleware is only installed into this directory. This is not a physical directory. It's a logical part uh, of the URL. So all the requests that contain this part that start with static, only those will activate uh, the static router. All the others will not be checked uh, by the static router. So we don't have any confusion, for example. We are not going to, to use the static router a lot because we'll move to uh, dynamic requests. Uh, as I mentioned, uh, the query parameters and the response, but the, um, and the uh, yeah, the query parameters, uh, the information that we get in the request uh, can be extracted in our function. For example, if we have a get method, we could have some parameters in the query string. And these are available in the query property of the request object. And they are already decoded and already parsed. Okay, so the, the, we don't need to actually check that string. We just uh, have uh, the property que uh, query.user that has a value fc and query.pass that has a value one, two, three. So the parsing of the query parameter is automatic. It's already done by Express. Mm -hmm. So we already have the information we need, uh, which is undefined or contains an actual value. If we want to process the body, uh, it's not automatic. So there is a, um, an argument, which a property which we call the request.body but normally is not uh, processed automatically. Uh, to enable the processing of the body, you should install some middleware according to the type of encodings that you want to be able to decode. For example, if we are working with JSON format, so information stored as uh, JavaScript strings, JavaScript object uh, notation, uh, we should install the expert.json middleware. That would take the body, which is by, def by default, uh, the body of an object of the request is a string, it's a string object that needs to be read. Mm -hmm. uh, the JSON middle will, will read the string, the stream, sorry, and uh, uh, populate the body with the properties that it will get uh, from, uh, from the JSON object. Okay, so uh, after that, it's all automatic. If you install this uh, middleware whenever uh, the server uh, receives a JSON body, it will automatically populate uh, the body property with all the properties uh, inside, with all the variables inside the JSON. Okay, but we, we should remember to install this one. It's, it's a pretty fine, we don't need to import, uh, to install anything, but we need to install in the application. If we want to process forms from the browser, we will need also this, you are encoded. Uh, if we don't need to process forms, we don't need it to wait. Uh, so, uh, Express it starts very minimal, it has a very basic uh, behavior, and then we can install additional middlewares to 
uh, enhance its uh, features depending on what we need. Mm -hmm. So we don't need to have all the uh, mechanisms uh, activated at once. So we should remember when we mm, when we uh, actually implement some uh, um, some APIs with JSON. Uh, I mentioned that uh, uh, paths are not uh, maybe just single strings uh, or maybe something more complex like uh, regular expression uh, or uh, or JavaScript or reg apps uh, object. Uh, Mm, but maybe we don't want to do something like that. One thing that is useful is uh, uh, to have a list uh, of URLs. So you may have different URLs uh, where you want the response to be the same. Well, maybe not identically the same, but handled by the same function. So you can list all of them in, a, in, a, in an array. But the most interesting part is having some dynamic or parametric parametric parts uh, in the URL. This is totally similar with what we did uh, with the React router. We specify a path uh, that contains some variables inside. This variable will match whatever, there's a matching you know, procedure here, so they will match uh, uh, whatever string the user puts here and whatever string the user puts there, and will make these values available in the params so let's not confuse query, which is decoding the query string, with params, uh, which is decoding the portion, the dynamic portion of the of the path of the route uh, string. Mm -hmm. And so these params uh, uh, will be populated with, the, for example, this first segment was called user ID, and so we have a property user ID with the value that the user actually inserted there, mm -hmm. and so on. So. We can use it, we can create uh, a URL that contains uh, some data. And these data are automatically extracted from the URL and made available in the params object uh, of, of, the, um, of the request so that we can use them in our code. Um, and this mechanism will be used a lot uh, for, for us when we are creating APIs. Okay, so these are some examples about logging, which I said before. Uh, there are some other middlewares, so I, I mentioned if we want to validate uh, some data, so the query parameters uh, or the JSON body, we could, uh, uh, for example, there's uh, Express Validator um, middleware that you can install and say, okay, with this URL, before executing my callback, uh, do a set of checks. And you see that there's a list here because we are installing many middlewares, more than one, to be run in sequence only for this URL, only for this route. So middleware can be used, can be installed on the whole site or on a portion of the, site, of the website using the application.use, app.use, or just on a single uh, request. Why? Uh, why on a single request? Because the validation rules are different according to the request. So they, we want, I want to um, say customize them. So in this case they will be already checked and the results of this validation will be available here in a function validation results. For example. So you don't need to do all the comparison yourself. You already have an, an object errors that will contain a list of errors that don't, don't match the rules that you specify. So you don't you avoid a lot of manual and tedious work of checking whether something is empty, is not empty, is minimum, maximum values. This, this library is doing that for you and it's already providing you the list uh, of uh, violations of the rules. Hmm. And, uh, and you said in this case, for example, if there are some errors, uh, I want to return a, a body with a JSON object uh, with the errors that I received uh, but it's not a normal JSON response when I give you the result, uh, it's an error response where I'm setting the status code uh, with an error code in some, of, of some kind. Mm -hmm. So I'm changing the status code because it's not a, an okay response, it's an error response, but nevertheless, I populate the body with information that the client may find useful to understand the, the cause of the error, what went wrong. Okay, otherwise, of course, uh, if no errors are present, you can, okay, uh, normally 
use the data, username and password or whatever. This guy. So these are, we, we have a list here, for example, of the of the middleware that can be used. Uh, we will briefly mention course uh, when we try to put together uh, the client and the server. We will also uh, work with passport, which is the kind of middleware that we are going to use for the user validation, for the login, password, uh, encryption, and so on. Uh, not in, sorry, not, uh, not encryption of the session, but uh, encryption of the credential, user credentials. We'll see that uh, when we deal with the authentication. The others are there if you, if you like, <laughs> if you find some of them useful, you can use them. Hmm? There's a lot of them. The mechanism is very simple. Okay. We saw the basic mechanism. What are we using it for? Hmm? Uh, in our, in our uh, architecture, where the most of the behavior most of the functionality will be inside the React application. So uh, the server side will not be used uh, to create uh, uh, web pages. Hmm. There's a lot of functionality in Express that I didn't even mention for uh, serving HTML pages, for uh, creating HTML page templates that will be updated with the content and so on. We are not using that because we are not serving we are not returning HTML pages. The HTML will be generated by React. Nothing will change. But at some point in time, React will need uh, to access some data from the database. Uh, and we will, the only way it can do that is to talk with our web server and ask for some operation. So some implementing, we need to be able to implement some APIs uh, where the application, our React application, can talk in some way to a database or other services. Let, let's focus on the database. We have some data here. We have the list of exams here. We need to change a date. We need to insert an exam. We need to, to get the list for printing them. So how can the application, the database could be the SQLite file, no? simply. But it's not in the browser. It's in the server somewhere else. And we cannot provide direct access to this file. We will never do that, okay? We, ne we can never ex expose direct access to our database. It can be, should be mediated in some way. So for doing that, we need to solve two problems. One is how to create a service with a set of endpoints, with a set of methods, with a set of functions that can be called and we may use it to manipulate the data on the database. Possibly with the regular structure, with the regular naming, so that it's easy to, uh, to understand what each function does. Okay, so we should, we should decide what kind of operations we, do we want to support on this database. Get a list of exams, get a change the date, but maybe we don't want to allow changing the score, I don't know. So we decide which operations are allowed on the database. We create an endpoint, an API endpoint for each, opera for each allowed operation. And uh, we are, uh, decide how to, what kind of data should be ex exchanged for these operations. So for example, in uh, give me the list of exams, uh, there's no information from the application to the database. I, there's no parameters. Just give me everything. And the response will be the list of all the exams. Encoded in some way. We are using JSON because uh, it's a normal encoding for the web. If we are adding a new exam, there will be some the encoding of a, the, an exam information going from the browser to the server, to the endpoint, and that will finally do the query to, do, to insert information in the, the database and there will be no information back, or just a confirmation, yes, it did, or there was some error, okay? So there are these two separate levels, one of encoding information that goes in both ways, and the other is uh, creating some APIs. Huh? Uh, JSON, I won't spend any, any additional words on that, it's just a very simple syntax, which is a subset uh, of the syntax for creating objects in uh, JavaScript. 
okay? Uh, when I mean a subset is that in JavaScript there are some syntax uh, shortcuts uh, that are not available in JSON, so we need to be aware when we are writing this uh, by hand. For example, in JavaScript we can use uh, the, say, the quotes uh, around the property of an object uh, are optional. In uh, uh, JSON they are mandatory, so we always should have some quotes here. And the quotes should always be double quotes, not single quotes. And uh, the other issue is that, um, okay, we can also only have properties of, of type number or string. One thing that is very annoying is that when you have a list, uh, for example, with, this is an object, of course, uh, with some pro four properties. In JavaScript, it's very convenient to have a comma here so that you can add or remove uh, or shuffle. Uh, in, uh, in JSON, it's not uh, allowed. So all the lines, all the properties should have a, a comma, but not the last one because it's a syntax error. So very stupid things. Uh, the, the syntax is more rigorous, it's simpler, just to make it easier to parse. JSON is a format that may be generated and parsed by all programming languages in the world, basically. So that's why they try to keep it very simple. But apart from that, it's just we are just, just using the brace for an object and a square bracket for an array, and that's it. Hmm? Uh, JSON manipulation in JavaScript is native. So in the standard library, we have these two functions, stringify and parse, which go from an object to a string and from a string to an object. So stringify will take any object and, and create a string and uh, parse will be will do the reverse we take a string that is formatted into the json syntax and we'll try to create an object uh, made of nesting objects and arrays uh, with the same uh, content is there a question no uh, it will uh, work uh, with the, the kind of information that we have in JSON. So whether the J, if the JSON, in this case, describes an object, this object contains one, two, three, four properties. This property is a string, this is a string, this is an object, and this is an array. Okay, so uh, in this case, the final result of the, of the parsing of this file will be an object. Because, because the first brace is a curly brace. If uh, we had uh, the, we, we can return an array just by, if we have uh, the square bracket at the beginning and then the list uh, of items of this array. Mm -hmm. uh, JSON may be, uh, what is that? May be anything, the type uh, uh, that can be returned are just a single string, a number, an object or an array. You can return any of these four, depending on how you build it. For returning an array, you have square uh, brackets. For returning an object, you have cur curly brackets, and then you can, of course, you can nest uh, all kinds of values if you want. So, at the, of course, when when I parsing, I I say that I return an object, but an object may be an array. Uh, an array is a type of object. So, in the case, in that case, it will be a normal array. Uh, just be careful that uh, this operation of converting to and from string, serializing and deserializing is not, um, doesn't preserve all the information about an object. Functions are not preserved. So if you have an object with some function properties, methods, they are not serialized because they are not supported. JSON only supports strings and numbers and objects and arrays, not functions. So functions will be dropped. And so when you recreate the object, the object will come with no method. Also will come with no identity. When you create a, uh, an object with a um, constructor function, like we did a new exam, this object remembers that it's an object of type exam, so it may have some properties attached to the type of object. And this will be lost when you recreate it. Um, and some of you experienced a similar thing in the, in the lab when uh, we, they were trying to pass the, the, exam, the film object uh, using the state in the router. Uh, some of you try to, okay, set uh, for the edit functionality, I'm sending you a copy of the film object in the location.state attribute. And you found that uh, the DJS object was destroyed 
was uh, what you received was not a DJS object, the property in the date property, but was actually a, 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 a normal JavaScript object with all the properties, all the, all the separate properties. That was the same mechanism because uh, also the location state gets serialized to a string, and when you deserialize it, you lose uh, all the functional properties. In JSON, if you want uh, to use it, uh, you can have a second uh, call, a uh, second parameter in the parse, which will be a reviver function, no? a function for recreating the real object starting from the data that you have in the JSON. Um, I don't know if it's worth uh, the hassle. Just remember that uh, JSON is just a data transfer operation. So use it just to transfer data. So you pack the data into the normal structure, arrays and, and, and object properties, and don't expect much more from that. Okay? Don't transfer too complex objects because they will not be received on the other hand. Um, so these are already predefined, so we can convert them uh, at any time. Um, and this solves this problem. We know very easily how to uh, convert objects to and from JSON. And then we need to represent uh, in some way the operation that we can do on the database. And for doing that, we could use a, a trick of uh, encoding with URIs the kind of objects that we want to operate on and using HTTP methods for deciding what to do with these objects. For example, uh, we, could yeah, we could have uh, some addresses that represent a collection of objects. The list of students, the list of courses. In this way, if we want to do an operation on a, on a list of students, we could use this URL. And we can register on the server a route responding to students. So if I do a get students, I am asking from the list of students. And the server should generate a JSON with the list of with the main information about the full list of students. Okay, so this URL doesn't correspond to a, to a web page. It just corresponds to a, an abstract concept, uh, an entity called students. And we do operations of the student. If I want to add a new student to my database, I could just do a post on students. So on the server, I will have app.post slash students that will receive the informa extract the information about the student and save it into the database. So in a way, the tables of our database can correspond to different URIs, okay? So we can uh, declare, expose to the client the, the information that we are managing in our server, and by calling get or post on that, uh, on those addresses, we enable the, 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 the browser to modify them. And these kind of URLs with you have the sort of entity name or table name are usually for collections. We, we have them in the plural form. And then we may have, a, uh, we want to identify a single item inside the collection. So, for example, we may have uh, one single student. So, inside the collection of students, let's identify a student with a given ID. This is just an address, but if, you, if I do a, I can program the server so that if I do a get on this address, I will get, get all the information about that specific student, not the list, only that one. If I do a, um, a put operation onto this address, I can change some information about that specific user. If I do a delete on this address, I, will, I would delete the information about that specific user. 
So in a way, I'm mixing you know, two choices. One, I'm choosing a schema for describing the objects in my database, tables or lists or collections, how you want to call them, and items or data or rows or records. I'm mapping them to a schema that will fit into a URL. And then I'm mapping HTTP commands onto operations on the data. So that at the end, with a single HTTP call to a given address, I'm sensing a lot of information. Hmm? Um, so the format in general for collections or table or entities is just a slash name in the plural form. The syntax for uh, a single item will be slash the type of item, the collection, the entity type, slash the identifier of the specific object. Oh, there is no law here. There is no rule. It's just a convention, but a very useful convention so that the URLs are very easy to read. Hmm? Um, and of course, we can support different operations on different type of objects. Uh, these operations will be mapped to HTTP methods. I find this is a, a useful table. So we can create uh, URLs that represent collections. What can we do on a collection? We can get the list of items, or we can add a new element to the collection. So we can get a get or a post to these URLs. Get retrieves the list of the items will return a JSON document uh, that encodes an array for which of, of elements uh, and each of them will represent information about a single item of that collection. Okay, that's the long form. Or add a new element. So the post will have an in the post uh, request body, a JSON that will describe the new object that we want to create. So on the server, the object will be created and added to the database in that specific collection. Uh, for single elements, single items, uh, what can we do? Well, we can retrieve the properties of the element, so all the information about that specific course, that specific movie, that specific exam, or whatever. You pass uh, the URL of a single resource, so it will be movies slash 37, and we return a JSON with all the properties. Uh, you may see that there can be some du duplication here. So if, I, if you have a, some objects with a few properties, three or four or five properties, uh, when we get the list, uh, we can have all the properties of the object listed there. So when I get the list, uh, I have all the movies. But uh, if we have a long list of objects, Maybe the get will not, we don't want to retrieve all of them. We want to retrieve only a subset of them. Or we want to retrieve only a sub subset of the properties. So maybe when I get the list of the movies, I only retrieve the ID, the name, and the year, maybe. And if I want some details about the, that movie, I will ask the details of that specific movie for not having a lot of information being transferred. So uh, the, the retrieving the list of items mean, will mean a list of the IDs and maybe some key properties of the items. And retrieving the properties of an element will, will mean retrieve all the properties of this element. Again, there is no rule, no law, it's just a convention, just uh, the choice that we make. This is just a framework that will help us to design this set of APIs. Um, this is for reading, and if I want to change an element, Okay, for creating a new element, uh, creating a new element is not an operation that we do on the element, uh, it's an operation that we do on the collection. Because when I create something, the object doesn't exist yet in the server. So I don't have a URL for it. I just post it to the, to the collection. But once the element is already there in the collection, I can delete it or modify it. And modifying is done with a put instead of a post. Normally, the, 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 dif the difference between post is post, it will add information, put will change information. 
and the content here will be the description of a new object that will be added and this will be the new description of an existing object that is modified this will, which will correspond to an update in database this will correspond to an insert in database basically hmm? not everything can be reduced to this schema to this uh, few options but uh, I would suggest we try to map most of the operations that we need onto this schema so that most of the implementation of the server APIs will be just uh, mm, you know uh, copy the same pattern over and over so here there are some some examples with, with, with where I replaced uh, the generic terms uh, collection and uh, um, entity with some specific uh, examples that interpret the same idea mm -hmm. uh, this is as you said it's one no, a collection but it's uh, sorry one convention we, we may decide to offer the server manipulation operations through this kind of uh, choices of mixing URIs and uh, HTTP methods, we are not the only ones. For, for example, this screenshot is taken from um, a, a Google internal document that sets the design, the design standards for their own APIs. So what they're telling is actually what they've shown in uh, the, the, the example before. At the high level, on your data structure, you have the usual CRUD methods, no? create, uh, read, delete, and update, uh, and, and list. Uh, and they will tell you what kind of uh, method to use uh, and what kind of URL to use for the result. Mm -hmm. uh, there's still a, a minor distinction between put and patch, if we want. Put is expected to receive a complete description of the object that we want to modify patch is expecting to receive a subset of the properties of the object so maybe i only want to change the data with patch i will send an object that only contains id and date no, not even the id the id is already in the url only the new date with put uh, i would send the whole object uh, with the maybe all the fields will be identical except the date uh, so that's the difference put will receive a expecting to receive a full object uh, and patch is expecting only to receive the modified properties then of course it depends on whether he, you we want to implement this functionality okay we are we are not forced to implement every method on every type of result only what we want to offer all we're thinking about your uh, uh, not everything is so simple so in databases with, where we, are, we only have one single table, hmm, the only concept that we have is uh, the list of items and the individual items. But if we have more than one table, we start having relationships between the different elements. So how do we map these relationships uh, with URLs? Oh, we can do that very easily, quite easily, most of the relationship with this syntax, collection, element, relationship name. So, for example, students 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6 is already the identifier of a single student. We may add a third fragment, courses, that will be the collection of courses to which this student is participating. So, a many-to-many -many relationship, no? I think of a database with a many-to-many -many relationship. A many-to-many -many relationship is actually a collection for each item of one table is a collection of the item of the other table that are mapped and vice versa hmm? so the relationship can be seen as uh, collections attached uh, to every single item and we are mapping like, like this so i want to see the list of my courses get this address i want to uh, add one enroll into one more course do a post there adding a new element to this url will would mean i need to implement that in a way so that it means that i uh, adding a new course to that specific user not in general to that specific user and on the other hand we can also see on the other direction courses name of the course 
is the identification of a single course, students may be the, enroll, the students enrolled in that course. So it can give you a list of students enrolled in that course. So every, let's say, relationship, one-to-one, one-to-many, many-to-many relationship can always be mapped in this, case, in this syntax. You don't need to go any farther, okay? You don't need to add a fourth segment or so. Because if you want to, if you add a fourth segment uh, after students, then you are matching a single student. So you don't need uh, the courses part for matching a single student. You just go with students. So three segments are enough for expressing any type of relational information in the database. A table, an entity, an item inside an entity, or the connected items, the list of connected items related to a single entity. Do we have many relationship types? We can create many names here. So for a course, we have the list of enrolled students. We may have the list of the students who passed the exams, uh, and so on. So maybe students or already you know, past students, uh, or something like that. Hmm? So uh, we are not bound to the name of the tables here, of course. We are, these are names or the semantic meaning of the relationship that we are seeking. Then of course, they should, we, this will be translated to a specific query <laughs> at the, on the database that will extract the right information according to the name. Hmm? So we try to think uh, on the oper oper operation about the data by finding the best, best description of the data that we want and the actual action that we want to apply to that data. Uh, we'll see that practically, so let's try not to design uh, some uh, uh, remote procedures, okay? So we don't want to create uh, an API that is called uh, get the list of the courses. No, we, we use the get method on the URL courses. Hmm? It's more general, it's more general, more generic. We don't have a pollution of different names. And this uh, is a rule that uh, is applied by many, many websites today. It's a standard. It also has a more fancy name. It's called REST. Now we, I just called it HTTP API because we are not imposing any special rules. But mm, there's more theory behind that. We'll see that in the, if you are if you the distributed uh, system programming course, uh, you will spend a good amount of time in understanding the best way of designing these kind of APIs. And there are guidelines that are called, you will find uh, um, something that's called the REST APIs uh, instead of just, AP, uh, which are just design rules uh, that are more, you know, uh, more in-depth uh, about uh, how to choose the URLs, how to choose the methods, and so on. You see, uh, for example, this is an example from the API of, of Twitter that uh, uh, the set of tweets uh, of a person is just a collection that they call, they call it the timeline of the user. And so if you get on this, uh, you are getting all the tweets of the user. In some cases, uh, the full collection may be too, too wide, too, too big, hmm? too large. And so you may want to add some filters. Not the whole collection, but filter or some property. Okay, so filtering is usually part uh, um, implemented through uh, the query string. Every no, every web server has their own convention, their own escapes. Uh, it's nice to see this table, but when you go to the reality, you need something maybe different, uh, something more, and you start to modify across this general pattern. Hmm? Um, okay. So what uh, we should do next uh, is to try, so we don't have any new technique here. We already have everything we need. We know how to create uh, HTTP endpoints. We already know how to store data into database. What we should do now, what we'll do in the next hour, would be to take our example of the exams. Remember from week three, we had a working uh, uh, console application where we have some method for inserting, adding, searching into database, okay? 
but this was just a standalone application. Right now, we want to expose this method to a web interface. So we will design the API for the server of the exam list. We'll design the API, meaning we decide which URLs we support, we do one old method, and so on, and then we will implement them using the four or five extras method that we know. Uh, if we didn't uh, down, if you didn't download it yet uh, in the sir in the, in the in GitHub, I already uploaded a directory in week ten, which is called exam server, that will contain okay the exams <laughs> a file that creates an, the exam object, and they put into this file dao.js the operation for reading the list of exams uh, and. Uh, adding exam. There's nothing new here. It's the same code. I made a cut and paste of the code that we had uh, in week number three, where we are using promises to execute a query on the database. So in order to avoid it, so SQLite, uh, and there's well, the same file uh, where it's called the transcript of SQLite. I just copies, copied this file from week number three, and now in the, after the break, uh, we are working with this project. So if you want to also copy these three files, DAO, exam, and transcript, uh, so that we can work together. Okay? Let's have some break. Okay. <laughs>